What's up, everybody? How y'all doing? This is Rob Brown coming to Yo, you. Yo, I'm Coach Lynch Hunt. What's happening? I'm Jerome Myers. Good to be here again, man. It's super exciting. Is it good or is it great? We got to be better than average, baby. Yo, I know you feel great because, um, man, you just came back from that uh, that keynote speaking wealth uh, of symposium and all that that you was putting it down, man. It. Give me a little Shoot bit on that, man. I already yeah, know it was movie. like that. Yo, I saw yeah, the man. exhibition that you had for the like display for the books and all that. Like, you can't even call it a display. It's got to be an exhibition. You know what I'm talking about, <laughs> yo, like I don't even like, yo, I've been doing books for a minute now, like, and I don't even have like walls that go up and yeah, like you know yeah. three dimensional type of stuff. But talk to me, man. Yeah, we presented at uh, Elite Wealth Advisor Symposium down in Hollywood, Florida. It's an event where they get together people who are managing a billion dollars or more for high net worth individuals. And we had opportunity to, to go in and talk about our book, Your Next, Find a Fulfillment After Your Exit, and really the Founder's Exit Paradox, which is a phenomenon that people experience when they exit. A lot of people think when you get the check, everything is better. But in the end, I think it exacerbates a lot of the issues that you've been ignoring while you've been focusing on your business. And so we got to present. It was really interesting. And I'll, Yo, I'll say it was smart amazing. As hell. Hold on, hold on, hold on one second. Yo, you're smart as hell, man. You, you <laughs> exacerbate and stuff. You hit symposiums with people managing billion dollars in the uh, in a portfolio like yeah, this shit is just yeah. way above my head real quick can cut, we back up one it second? Out. no no we gotta back this shit up real quick man. first yeah. of all you you got you you're speaking to people who are managing portfolios of over a billion dollars yeah. you talk about exiting and uh you got to, the worst symposium is tied to the place that you're speaking at um i got i don't even know what the, like i go i got speaking engagements <laughs> this guy's got symposium <laughs> yeah, cut it out. Yeah, you try to have the way words but, every but, day. Yeah, but my shit is tied to physical fitness, striations and shit. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Whip. Talk no. to me, man. So, I didn't mean to rudely interrupt you. I'm sorry. I didn't think it was rude, but we we breaking down the vocabulary words. Sometimes I get ahead of myself, but I, I appreciate you slowing me down. At the end of the day, when people sell their businesses, they feel a sense of loss. Uh, everybody around them thinks that they're on top of the world. They feel like they hit the lottery and everybody who is on the other side of uh, Rod and I have talked about this knows that there is a downside to it, but nobody really wants to talk to talk about it. It's a dirty little secret. And so we're shining light on this problem. We call the founders exit paradox and we're getting opportunities to speak around the country so that people are aware of this and that, when they get there, they actually have a plan on what they're going to do on the other side of it. Some way to make impact, some way to make a difference, because that in the end is the only true success. We're here to be of service. And so we're carrying that message around the country, man. It's a pretty dope stuff, man. It's the, um, it's the practical stuff that people need uh, for the end game. You know what I'm saying? When they finally get to the end of the game, there's, there's even a coach for you at the end of the game. And that shit is crazy dog. Because I remember when uh, the homie Rob Brown um, was in this weird space and he hit me up and he was just like, you know, it was messing with him because he was in this space where it, it was a transition where, all right, I guess he had already sold or whatever. And now he's, you know, he's got to basically work for somebody else for yeah. a little bit of time, you know, to help the transition with the, I don't know, y'all know the words and stuff like that, but it's just pretty cool to kind of see, you know, all this stuff transpire, like just on a reverse engineer type side. Like, so we were in it real time a few years ago, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, to get that call and, fun, and like, just for like the big homie that everybody looks up to, you know, Rob Brown has the answers for everything. And then he's in a weird, space and he's just like mm. I just need to talk you know that type of thing and yo I'm struggling with this this that's third so you know like I mean I let Rod you know speak more to that but for me it's just like oh shit like I'm getting you know film 
right now. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I get a chance to actually see this on the other side and it's like, Oh, this is, this is pretty dope. And um, now we have this podcast, the end game. And a lot of things we talk about, you know, are helping people get to this point. And now we have, you know, a coach to get here and a coach to get here. And then a coach when you actually get here. So I don't know, it's just some pretty dope stuff, man. And I just, I just love everything that we're putting together and how everything is just falling into place, man. But Rod, yeah. Talk a little bit about that real quick, man, before we actually even get into, you know what I mean? The topics. Yeah, it was, um, it was definitely an interesting time. And, um, uh, Jerome, apropos to, to the Lynch hunt, his response was <laughs> a lot of times, you know, I'm seeking like, yo, let's, let's chop this up. Let's, 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 let's talk through this. His response was, ain't this what you asked for? <laughs> That's it. You ain't prayed for it, man. Yeah. <laughs> right. Hey. It was no soft landing. Isn't this what you wanted? So, um, yeah. yeah. So it's definitely a, you know, especially if it's, if you've been in something for a, a long period of time and I actually heard NBA players talking about leaving the NBA, exiting the NBA and they got a bunch of money. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden they have a bunch of time and mm-hmm. they've been playing basketball for you know, 20 years since they were 10 years old. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're not playing basketball. And then so one day, all of a sudden, you're not running your business the way you run your business and loving your business and loving your customers and loving your staff, loving the communities that you serve. Uh, it's being done differently by someone else. And there, there are a bunch of emotions that that come with that. So, yeah, it's exciting for... I don't know, a few days after the wire hits when that wire hits. Yeah, that's really exciting. But then, you know, all of the emotional stuff that uh, comes behind that is is definitely is definitely a challenge. Hey, not yeah. to mention there's a big component missing where that identity uh, yeah. now is is lost, uh, you know, in, in that transition as well. Um, so, you know, right now I know you about to jump in there real quick. I just want to say one thing that um with Rod's reference to, you know, the sports, um, it literally just opened up our scope of practice and our demographics that we can now, uh, yes, yes, yes. That, that X, that paradox is, is, it's just, yeah, it's going through the roof, through the roof. Yeah. So there was a guy at the conference named Rod and he works with professional athletes exclusively. And we were talking about the transition that they have, if he can actually get them through year four, because it's like years one through four, it's a crapshoot on whether they're going to spend all their money or if they're going to actually try to invest it wisely. But Lynch, you, you hit the point. So the there's four things that I think really shock people when they go to the exit. One is their self image. So, so much of our self image is wrapped up in what we do. The second one is our relationships. So we've got this pretty cool quadrant exercise that we have people do. We call it a two C matrix where they put the five people they spend the most time with on the matrix. And we've got some axes and won't give you everything here, but people go through that. And what happens more often than not is over 60% of the people that are in that five are tied to their business. And when they leave that business, so do those relationships leave their life. And so imagine five people you talk to on a daily basis or a weekly basis, and you no longer have a reason to talk to them. Mm. And so now you're in a space or this place where you have to uh, find new friends. And for a lot of adults, finding new friends is a really difficult thing. And then the third thing is the actual work that you do. So for a lot of high performing founders or business owners, they're getting up four or five o'clock in the morning, they're hitting the gym, then they're going into the office and working all day. Um, They might do dinner with the family. They might not. They might tuck the kids in the bed. They might not. And then a lot of them are back on the computer. So imagine everything that we talked about from um, when they got out of the gym to when they put the kids in the bed, like all of that time is now free. And so they don't know what to do with work. And that in and of itself just creates this suck. Um, one of the guys that I referenced in my talk is a, is a man named Rick Edelman. He ran a company called Edelman Financial. 
and he sold it two or three times for big numbers. And what he calls it is a pure void. It's like stepping out into the pure void. And like he, he just ran down like it was an absolute brilliant case study on how the exit paradox happens, why it happens and what they did, him and his wife. Um, they built the practice together, what they did in order to get prepared for it. But what he said was it doesn't matter how prepared you are, you're still going to experience the feelings, but knowing that you're going to experience the feelings is half the battle. And Rod, I know you told me it lasted longer than you expected it to last. And it was deeper than you expected it to be. And I don't even know if you had a real expectation or who you talked to about the exit before you exited it. But um, I know I went back, I went through it last summer when we exited a deal. So uh, it, it happens regardless of how prepared you are, or what you know about it, if you've been in the thing long enough to have some attachment to it. Yeah, it's 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 a, a level of grief. Right. And mourning. So, mm -hmm. you know, you may have someone, you know, that's close to you and you know, that's, you know, family member. They're about to pass and you know they're going to pass and because of their disease or whatever. And when it happens, you're still not like rock solid. Right. You still have grief and you still have mourning. And you're right. The separation is, um, you know, multi level. It's not just the business. It's the business, but it's the people. And that was my biggest struggle, being separated from the people the way I was separated from the people. Did I have their phone number? Could I shoot them a text message? Absolutely. But that relationship that we have uh, from a business standpoint, that was gone. And it wasn't mm -hmm. being replaced properly, in, in, in my opinion, by the, the people that, that acquired us, so. Yeah. <clears throat> so what are we gonna talk about today, guys? <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> hey, I mean, but overall, real quick, before we move on to that, because we, we, we gotta move, right? But overall, how did you feel about, you know, me, your entire, you know, uh, symposium <laughs> I, I would say that we won best booth for sure and that for part sure. was exciting um the talk i was i would be honest i was extremely nervous uh the room if you can imagine was stoic there was no emotion there was no head nodding there was no audible acknowledgement the best that any speaker got before me was getting people to stand up and sit down on command yeah. and so i got up there and I had some videos and I had some jokes and I got some laughter. I got That's some good. people saying, mm -hmm. and you know, when you get the grunts and the groans, it felt like you, I was in Sunday service at times. And that for me just reaffirmed that we're on to something and we actually have a solution that people really need and they don't have to continue to suffer in silence. The other thing I would say that was really impactful for me was to watch men in their 50s come up to me and tell me stories about the stuff that they were doing for next one guy he, he died from a heart attack at 36 they were able to resuscitate him and then he went on to start paying for the parents of children who have a heart cardiac condition to wow. be available to travel with them and pay for their lodging while they're getting treatment and when I pushed him on it a little bit, he shed a tear and then he apologized. And I said, why are you apologizing for crying? And he was like, well, I guess I just care about this too much. And that for me really hit a core because I see so many people pretending like they don't care. Right. Because it's not socially acceptable. They're supposed to be stoic. They're supposed to be detached. They're not supposed to have any emotion. And. I don't think that's real. I think we have to live in a world and operate in a way where we're passionate about things and our emotions come out from it. And so that for me was super powerful that people felt like they could be that vulnerable with me when we never met or had a conversation before. 
Well, you're connected. So, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's all about the connection. You know what I'm saying? So that means your talk was definitely relevant. And, you know, you definitely did what you were supposed to do while you was up there because people connected with it and they feel open enough to, you know, communicate and convey, you know, some of the deep things that they have inside them. Then, you know, you 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 struck a few chords. So you did your thing. Yeah. You did your thing. Grateful, Congratulations, man. man. Great grateful. job. Yeah. Hey, great job. Yo, so yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Look, um, you know, we got the dope production, you know, these days and our producers are telling us we need to move on to the next topic. Yo, the hot stuff right now, man, everybody's talking about it, man. You know, the Grammys and, and Jay-Z, you know, getting up there on on the joint, man. Well, you know, um, there was a couple of things that 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 uh, stood out to me about, you know, just Jay-Z getting up there and uh you know, uh, being brave, uh, I would say, <laughs> uh, of having a little bit of courage, uh, you know, uh, for lack of better words. Um, I think the first thing I, I want to say that that kind of stood out to me that he talked about was just um, showing up. Um, I heard him say before, uh, you know, the genius thing that that they did uh, with Rockefeller was just, you know, um, never giving up. And I think, you know, showing up is a, is a theme that he actually talks about. But in this context, um, I, I think that um, I want to ask, you know, y'all, like, do you continue to show up even when people don't see your value? Um, you know, this is a entirely different context because he ended his speech off talking about how, you know, show up until, you know, you're CEO or show up until you you worth a billion dollars. I don't know exactly how he said it, but basically, you know, you just keep showing up until, you know, what I mean, you make the magic happen. You know what I'm saying? But um, I'm asking y'all, like, you know, does it. Will everybody continue to show up or should they continue to show up even when people don't see, you know, your value? And what do y'all think about that? Yeah, it depends on how committed you are to your dream, right? And so um, the story rings true over and over and over again in sports, right? And I'm, I apologize about all the sports analogies, but I watched a story about Josh Allen. Josh Allen played for or plays for the Buffalo Bills, top five quarterback in the NFL. Coming out of high school, he had zero offers. Coming out of high school, he was zero ranked, right? S stars wise. You know, you got the kids that were four and five stars. He had zero stars. He had uh, no offers and ended up going to a JUCO and balled out at the JUCO and still only had one offer. Went to that school. I believe it was Wisconsin, Wichita State. Uh, forget the school, but he goes there, he balls out, and now he's top five. So the moral of that story is you only fail when you quit. And so showing up is, you know, uh, 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 it's paramount to your dream until, you know, your vision, your goals, where, where you ultimately want to see yourself. You can't quit. You can't stop. And so you have to show up in, in spite of, you know, what people say, what people think, what they don't think. Look at the scouting reports on Steph Curry. Right. It, you know, he's slow. He can't guard. He. You know, he, yeah. he depends on the jump shot too much. He's this. And now he's going down in history as the greatest shooter in NBA history. So, man, you got to show up. man. It's like, thank you. Thank you, producer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I know we get with a W. Uh, so, yeah, man, you got to show up. It's like it's it's paramount. I mean, you know, it's. it's I love. It's I love. Yes. Well, I love the context um, that you're, you know, referring to in that. And we could pull a thousand bars from what you just talked about and just said. And hopefully if your mic is working right, we'll be able to use, you'll probably get five micros from that right there. And a couple of them will go viral. You know what I'm saying? But uh, sounds like it's still going viral. out for me. Yeah. Anyway, but here's another context though. You know what I mean? And maybe Jerome, you can maybe talk a little bit about this. Like, um, you know, these, these people are successful. Jay-Z's a billionaire. He's got a bunch of Grammys. He's got number one albums and all this different type of stuff. You know, when will, you know, somebody like him 
make it clear that we ain't showing up until y'all make the rap album of the year a part of the broadcast. Like, when will the boycott, when will the sit down, when will the sit in, when will that stuff take place with these people of, you know, the new ages and the new millennials, man? Because if you ask me, our leadership today ain't making no sacrifices like that because we still we're too scared to lose some shit. You know what I'm saying? And um, this, this, let you me know, ask you, you this though. Let me ask you. Let me ahead. ask you this: Is Jay Z still wealthy with or without the Grammys? A thousand he percent. still influential he, he gonna, with or ab- without the Grammys? Absolutely. So why 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 is you know we gotta make them give you know somebody album of the year? Uh, I mean, why? because because it ain't about him no more. Who is it? Because it ain't about him. I'm with Kanye. You see what Kanye did with his Grammy? Hold hold on, hold on, real quick. Kanye, Jay Z ain't even with Kanye. And then to turn around 15 years later and do the same thing that he didn't stand with Kanye on. So yeah, he turned his back on the homie when he did that for Beyonce. I don't know how many years ago. Now. Mm He's saying the same thing for his wife that Kanye was saying back then. Like, yeah, but it none of this shit makes sense. Like, he's a billionaire. He's going to be wealthy regardless. A person like him can make a bigger stand than, than, and it's not even for him no more. So his Grammy don't mean shit. He's drinking out of this shit. But the young cat that's coming up, he need to be seen on that platform. He need to be heard on that platform. He needs the thing to better his career so he can get to the next saddle and get to the next joint. And he can get five stars because now he, you know what I mean? They seeing the value that he actually holds. So you, you're you're pretty much saying that black artists need the Grammys. I'm saying that black artists is going to continue to need the highest um, accolades in order to 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 so you're to show the their relevance. High accolade. I'm not. They are. I don't give a fuck about that shit. L- listen, I'm not. They are. They keep going. They keep showing up. Who's they keep they? accepting them. They who is that? Day. Well, I mean, the, the clip, black elite, the black yeah, elite. I mean, the clip, Jay Z said they boycotted, but he watched it, right? I forget who else, DMX or somebody else watched it, even though, even if they didn't go and show up. And so the point is, they still want the validation. They Absolutely. still want to be recognized by the powers that be. And I just question whether or not the powers that be are truly the powers that be. I, I don't know if getting a Grammy actually changes his reach. I don't know. They are the power. I don't think the powers that be are the powers that be. I don't think the Grammys, I'll give you another great example. I'm back to sports, but the NCAA. Why do people need the NCAA? They don't need the NCAA. Why do conferences need the NCAA? Why do you're making Rod, you're making a valid point. But as soon as I tell you that about, Dion, you were ready to, to be like, nah, Dion, he should have went to Colorado. It's for his kids and all this other shit. I'm like, yo, they don't need them. They don't need that. Build your own shit. And when I start talking like that, y'all like, nah, what are you talking about? This, that, and the third. Like, honestly, we're saying the same shit, but y'all are changing arguments. Don't like, you got to pick a side and stay on that joint. If we're going to be black, we got to be black all the way down. If we're not going to go with a validation and we don't need power five validation, we don't need uh, NFL validation. We don't need none of that shit. If we're going to go, uh, what's his name? Um, Ice Cube. We got to go Ice Cube down and we don't need none of that shit. We got to keep rocking because at the end of the day, we are like, I'll I be telling y'all this. I'll be telling y'all that. The influencers are chasing the big companies and the big brands and the big brands know they need the influencers. So they they all like doing this, this circle thing. But the influencers keep going for the stupid ass deals like Michael Jordan. He gets the dumb uh, footwear deal. And now everybody else goes with the dumb footwear deal moving forward after that because he got the best one. And we all like we say the same thing in different contexts. But at the end of the day, they don't understand their star power. If you pull the star power the ratings go down when the ratings go down they lose money and we know in america that when you lose money shit changes 
So if a nigga really wanted to sacrifice something, they would they would make some changes. But you probably can't see these people I got on the wall over here. Can you see? No, you probably which, which side of me? I can see you. Maybe I, I go this way. Him. Maybe I gotta go this way. Where I? Where, which way am I? Uh, let me get out the way. You see these people here? They were sacrificing shit. Yo, I'm surrounded by this shit, so I know that. Yo, don't let none of that shit like get you off your square yo you gotta understand what's important so certain shit like i don't be giving up. that's why i don't be moved by none of them niggas and none of that shit because ain't none of them rocking like this no more they ain't none of them coming together ain't none of them saying i ain't doing it ain't none of them lo- willing to lose their title to to make a stand for something for the betterment of humanity not just black people for the betterment of humanity. He like, yo, I ain't fighting y'all war. You can have can my title. We can go down title. a whole rabbit hole about that. We can go down a whole nother rabbit hole about that. Those about those people. You're right. I don't know if we got time. I don't know if we got you know. Because basically, you know, MLK came back and said, I mean, that's why he got killed. He got killed because he said, "Whoa, wait a minute. The stuff I was fighting for didn't cost America a dime." To sit at a lunch table, to ride in the front of the bus, that didn't cost America a dime. But now I want silver rights, right? And so that's when it became a problem, and that's why he got killed. So we should be chasing silver rights with our collective power and not the whole civil rights. I'll just put that out there. Let's see where that lands. Silver is in like moolah, guap, mm. money. Yeah, that, that's that's what we're talking about. Like you didn't say nothing that I didn't say. We will control more of the stake when we start to understand our power. So we're not really chasing that. We're chasing uh, uh, the actual accolade. Which right. means nothing in the grand the, scheme the of things. Significance. We got our, we got our eye on the the wrong ring. You know, say people want to you know chase the ring that that golden ring. It's the wrong ring. Significance is 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 relative, right? And so um, so yeah, I think it's the you know, yeah you, 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 Bill Gates ain't trying to win a Grammy. Elon Musk not trying to win a Grammy. Mark Zuckerberg, he's he's certainly not trying to win a Grammy. He ain't trying to win no award. They don't, they don't, they don't have a trophy though. case. Huh? They're not entertainers. But okay. If you, all right. I'm just saying, like, Taylor Swift is They're playing to a different game. World Tour. They're playing a different game. Beyonce, right? I don't game. think Beyonce really cares about album of the year. I mean, Beyonce has the most Grammys, number one. Number two, she's probably the wealthiest artist. Her and Taylor are probably, and Rihanna are, you know, they they switch those positions from time to time. So I mean, that Forbes list is is significant. That's the, I mean, me, that's the that's the list I'm chasing. But or I'm for target. the artists, I think for artists and entertainers, being validated, people appreciating their art is the ultimate form of appreciation to them but i think it's i think peers. if you're playing a business game you want to make money i think it's their peers though i think it's their peers that validate them that that means more than a group of people who don't know them who can't relate to them uh who kiki in their face when they see them because of their significance but i think they seek validation the artists seek validation from the peers more so than you know, these award shows. Now, some people, some want, they want the Grammys. They want the American Music Awards. They want the Oscars. They want the yada, yada, yada. But I don't know. I just think they, the validation comes from their peers. Who says, man, you're dope. Well, I mean. I don't want to follow you. I don't, I don't want to be in a scene with you. I don't want to be on the record with you because you're, you're dope. I, if I, if I think about high school athletes, or I think about athletes in general, do they care more that they got the MVP award or do they care more 
that they were voted team captain by their teammates. Depends on the cat. Depends on the individual. I mean, and MVP, so for some people they care less about getting the MVP. For some people, it might mean a whole lot. But I mean, if we if we did a survey, my guess is they care more about being chosen by their peers to be the team captain. Okay. And so Especially that would be in alignment. Awards, a lot of the awards, they're watered down and they're more political than anything. Right. Mm. So if Lamar Jackson doesn't win MVP of the NFL for this season, my point is that there's no question. No ifs, no ands, no buts. He's just not in the big game. But outside of that, he was the most valuable player to his team and to the NFL, to their image. But, you know, we'll see. Politics, political, you know, all that How, stuff. Man. If we keep going down the Jay-Z talk, do you think he was making it more difficult for Blue? With sharing like in that moment, his perspective or, or in, in that moment, like I mean, she's there standing with them, right? Yeah. Is he making it more difficult for her, or is he opening the door for her? Um, I, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, when your parents are worth billions of dollars uh, and they've done everything under the sun, shit is going to be difficult with whatever you do. Um, the regular shit is going to come easy to you because you can buy that, but whatever it is she's trying to do, that shit going to be hard. Um, nah, she up there, she up there with the big dog and, you know, ain't, ain't nobody not liking her because of what her dad said. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, and he ain't going, he ain't going to say it like maliciously, like, you know, like Kanye went up there and took the mic from Taylor Swift. So she ain't going to have a whole, Jay ain't going to have a whole bunch of white people mad at him and his family for the way he, you know, did it. It was actually his time. You know what I'm saying? And then he just chose to say what he said. Um, yeah, her shit, she's going to be gifted in some type of way because you just don't, you know, come from that type of stock and not have some type of genius in, in your dang on DNA. You know what I'm saying? Like you see the stuff with your daughters already. You're like, I don't know what they're going to wind up doing, but um, yeah. they're special. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's something special there. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you guys are both, you know, super successful and those are big shoes to fill just like Jay-Z's and Beyonce's shoes are like super huge to fill. But, um, you know, she's already, uh, you know, doing her thing. You know what I'm saying? Like shit, everything's going to be hard. You know what I mean? Everything. I, I think, I think they are embracing the hard stuff for her. I think they are embracing and not shielding or hiding her. Just think about what she did over her summer break. She went on tour with her mom Whew. and she danced as a dancer, right? Um, I was very critical of her being a performer on a Beyonce stage um, because I didn't think she was ready. I didn't think she was prepared just by her performance. But over time, we saw her stick it out. We saw her. I know she saw some of the comments that people um, were saying. Um, I know she saw, you know, just some of the there was some constructive criticism, but there was just some vile, just people just like not really caring. I know she saw that stuff at 11 years old and still pressed through and kept performing and kept getting better. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that, you know, we talk about developing the calluses. I think that's what they're doing. And because Beyonce, she didn't have an easy road, you know, because Matthew knows mm -hmm. didn't coddle her. And so I think that all of this is a part of it, like standing on a Grammy stage in front of all these people, um, there present yeah. but then the millions of people that were watching i think that's just that's a, that's a part of the training that's a part of the boot camp you know that's a part of you know going through what's necessary to prepare her for you know her exercising her gift 
at some point. So, yeah, they had a really I, cool moment. And I, and I don't grab your hand. I don't think they. I don't think Jay Z or Beyonce care what we think about how they're raising their daughter. Yeah, and for me, it wasn't about how they're raising their daughter. It's when he was on stage and they had the moment where he grabbed her hand because he could sense how uncomfortable she was. And then he went on and he said, hey, I tell the truth when I get nervous. And then he went on and talked about how certain stuff didn't make sense because I thought he was talking about Blue, but he's like, hey, you got more Grammys than everybody else. And um, but you don't get I forget what he was referencing, but something didn't yeah. line up and he, he basically told them that they were out of alignment or incongruent with the way that they actually make awards and yeah. the way that he did it in the space where his daughter was standing there in that really uncomfortable uh, situation where everybody's watching. I'm sure the producers were squirming because they didn't know where to go and they didn't have a way to cut it. And it was just like, well, now will he not win an award next year or will they make sure that other people who want to speak out against things that they don't agree with when they win awards, will they make sure that they don't get the mic again? Because, I mean, you, a lot of times you can get silenced when you use the platform that you didn't build in order to share a message that doesn't further promote the platform. I mean, I, I, I know I went through that with, uh, I was speaking at one of the largest multifamily investing conferences in the country and I finished my talk early and the host came on and he was like, hey, so let's just kind of talk about things. And he's like, and he went into this t conversation about diversity. And so I told him exactly how I felt about it. And I told him how we were doing people a disservice by not actually lending our mic and our platform to people who weren't 40 or 50 year old white guys. And I didn't get invited back the next year and I've never been invited back again as a result. And I know it was directly related to that because I sold more tickets than the majority of people that, or on that event on an annual basis. And so when I asked the question, is he making it harder for her? It's one standing in that space. Now she's a part of all of those clips, right? And so, and then it's like, well, this is what's being taught in the home. And I just wonder if people are gonna um, find a way. Sometimes people will retaliate against you by going to your kids. This is the thing that I thought. No question. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right, but um, there, like, when you create a demand for something that's so high, um, you're going to wind up being the fool to not, um, you know, indulge in it or, uh, you know, uh, render that service or, you know, what I'm saying, or use that artist and things like that. So, um, it's always going to be, you know, uh, the probably someone else's loss to not you know, uh, you know, hire this person or go with this person or, you know, have this person, um, you know, you know, you understand what I'm saying? It's always going to be, you know, somebody's loss, uh, when you're and, dope, you know what I'm saying? Jay -Z, he's criticized, he's criticized platforms like his whole career in music. He's criticized the Grammys before in music, you know, he's criticized the Super Bowl or the NFL before in music. So yeah, I, I don't, and you know, Net worth still continues to climb, and I think blue. Right. So at what? So what I'm saying is, at what point do we? You know, what I mean, do we not have to show up? You know, to those platforms. So Jerome's never get invited back. So you know, I mean, at, at what point do we make a? Do we make our point by not showing up and pulling our influence from there? You, you understand what I'm saying? When you're like super huge and shit like that, but that's going back down the same hole. Well, and so what I encourage people to do is look at the speakers for conferences. And if nobody looks like you, why would you buy a ticket? Like I ask that question regularly for people. And I mean, it's, if if we're not there and we're not represented as speakers, then we're only good as customers. Right. And for me, that is a, a challenge. If I'm only good enough to buy from you and I can't produce anything for your consumption, then I probably shouldn't be a consumer either. Is my belief. Mm. 
Mm. I like it. And what about it? What about the other way around? What about when you're the like the only you're the speaker, but you're the only black person there? We gotta we gotta crush it. We gotta open the door for other people, right? The the reason why they'll say that they don't have others is either because they don't know or they don't do well. Not qualified. Yeah. Right. And so if I do well, if I get the highest ratings, if I get the highest attendance in my session, I get the highest ratings. When you do the yeah. survey, feedback, then yeah. you can't say that we're not qualified. <laughs> now the question is, can we do, do we, do you know other people? And so now it's my job as a conduit, as a connect to open yeah. that side open door that and door. bring people yeah. in who are oh, going to yeah. further create opportunities Me and Rod because they're going to carry joint the flag. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and Rod are going to burn that joint down. <laughs> Not me. I guess, I guess, I mean, we're talking about proving that we're qualified in 2024. It's a like, whole thing. Huh? It's a whole thing. It's an exposure thing. I mean, I've walked in rooms where people have never seen anybody who looks like me have the conversation that we're having. I mean, it's a real thing. Yeah. And for yeah. all the people who are in the Fortune 500s and in executive management, they're the only one. There's one. Right. There's space for one. Right. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know. I'm just more, I'm more interested in us trying to create our own rooms. I think that's very valid. And like like Elle said, when I stop bringing my talent to your room, and I only bring the talent to my room, you got a feeling you're going to start coming to my room. A hundred percent. We started seeing some of that with kids going to HBCUs instead of the PWIs for sports. Right. But as long as people only believe that they can get the check if they go to the NFL or the NBA, that's where the talent's going to be. We had our own league. It's my belief that every kid of color should go to HBCU if they're going to go to college. Right. I think they got to get that experience. They have to get that experience. You can't get it somewhere else. No. You mean the HBCU experience? Yeah. Yeah, you can't, I mean, the you experience the of being experience. around other people yeah. who are talented and having that concentration of people who look like you with that level of talent. Right. I don't know yeah. where else you can get that experience. Some people are fortunate enough to get some of that in high school, but I think it's just a different level when you're actually paying for that education uh, yeah. and studying for whatever professional career you may be looking to go into. Yeah. I mean, when you but when you look at like a Colorado, they look like an HBCU. They're not. But if you just look at the team, they look like an HBCU. But the sports team is probably the entire population. 100 percent or a high percentage of the population. Right. 100 percent. That's not real for me. Like I play college sports, but that isn't an indication of what the experience is in school. Yeah. So I mean, you're in a Greek letter say, organization. Swag surfing at, at, uh, at Colorado. I, I think we make everything cool. And I think they want to do all the cool things. I think they want the band. I think they want all of the, the stuff that we call culture. I think they want all of that because it's not what they get to experience. But it, this kind of goes to the point about taking your talent to another room. Like we're trying to get in a room because we feel like we're locked out of it where they want everything that is outside of the room. Yeah. Right. But I mean, for well, me, that's just create, a marketing in play. They'll let you create the room and let you design the room, but you can't come in, can't have a seat in a whole bunch of rooms. We created a room. People can come sit down in our room if they really yep. want to. Have a squat. Yeah. I mean, it's wild. We, we actually, we were talking about, um, you was like, it's, you know, 2024, and we're still talking about, um, you know, like being accepted, you know, all that different type of stuff. But I don't know. I think that's the same reason why we're still selling out. I just... What does it mean to sell out? 
I mean, you see it. We're going to go over here and we're going to go ahead and do what we need to do over here and we'll be back, y'all. And then we never come back. It's like wearing a skirt to perform at the Super Bowl. Yeah, man, I don't even know what's up with the skirt, John, man. Boy, they said it's Charleston okay. White said, y'all crazy. Charleston White said he he's a sellout. <laughs> he said, Charleston White said he going to get the white man money. He going to get that white bag because he is sick and tired of y'all. Little bitty bags. Can't buy his kids ice cream because he's out there in the community, serving the community. And anybody that's out there doing that is broke. And they're okay with being broke. And Charleston White said he's going back over here and get with that white squad so he can get a bag. And uh, then is, what? Is he a sellout? Yeah, I think those um, comments that you're referring to, it was um, part of a, a larger conversation. And he was being facetious um, during that part in that time. Um, but, uh, I, you know, you got to kind of check out the whole thing and understand it in context. Okay, so so he said, so yeah, he said true. stuff for a bunch of people. He said stuff for a bunch of people to just kind of latch on to one part, like kind of like the Bible, and then people kind of run with that and <laughs> you know, look at the part before that and the part behind it. I didn't and, say that, Pastor. Yeah, I, you know, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'll say that. Pastor. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, kind of like that. He does stuff for shock value, and that's the part that's going to go viral, and then that's the part he actually gets the bag and the check from. Um, but yeah, he's a, that's a super smart individual. So he knows how to, you know, he, he get this person over here and get that person over there. The ones from the top, ones from the bottom. And he just know how to, you know, he know how to make it all work to his advantage. So let me ask you, let me ask y'all something, man. So there are, are a gazillion podcasts there, are, you know, there are a gazillion TV shows. And everybody's on something, right? They're on Charleston White. They're on Cat Williams. They're on First Take, arguing about who's the best at, you know, football. Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Who's not? Who's who's the better coach? Um, who's the better artist? Like what? Out of all this stuff, all this content, all this media, like what's important? Right. If you got, if you're responsible, if you're a leader and you're responsible for a group of people and responsible for helping them identify what serves them, like what what's important? None and what of the entertainment. Really be, I'm sorry, Jerome. None of that entertainment stuff for sure. Why do I care about the score of the game? Why do I care about? who's a better athlete? Like, why Why do I care about any of that? How is that going to impact or improve my life? I mean, that that stuff gets all of the attention, right? The entertainment stuff that you're talking about. Even the, the education that's cloaked in entertainment. Or actually the, yeah, the, 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 they pretend that is education, but it's more entertainment. I mean, like, well, the entertainment piece and I had to learn this the hard way. The entertainment piece is to keep people interested long enough to get the lesson to them because people don't want the raw medicine. Right. They don't want to take the vitamin. So you got to wrap it up in whatever in order to get them to eat it, put sugar on it. And that's what the entertainment piece is. But for those people who can do the fast, who can go raw for a week, who can do the things that will actually get the maximum benefit for them. Like that's why it's so easy to, I think it's easy to be extraordinary today because so many people are playing at this low level. They're vibrating at such a low frequency that you, if you're willing to do the stuff that's uncomfortable can be so much further ahead of other people. So do you just, just nobody there the playing? Road, do you think the road less traveled has still at one point the road less traveled bared significant value? You think that's still the case? Thousand percent. And the, the separation is you think the separation is greater now than it used to be? Between A thousand percent. That, that do the work. Yeah, because I mean, think about it, at least from my perspective, 
we got all these highlight reels with social media. Yeah. So everybody believes that there is no work in between the sowing and the harvest. Absolutely. There's nothing in between. And so the people who are actually out there working in the field know that the harvest is going to be meaningfully different from the person who just planted it and waited for the harvest to happen. Absolutely. And so those people who are doing the work and the work can be a bunch of different things, depending on what you want to accomplish. But those who do the actual work, those who make the sacrifices, those that make the actual investments are going to be the ones that reap and reap in ways that they probably couldn't even imagine. That's what I told a bunch of kids today. I had to speak at a school today, a middle school, the IB program, really smart kids. And um, when I first walked in, everybody's head is in the phone. And then the director told everybody to put their phones up. Um, but I had uh, a conversation with the administrators and then later talked to the kids about, you know, them comparing their situations to someone else's fake best on social media. First of all, that's their perceived best. And then it's, then it's all fake. It's not even real. And then these kids, they have it tough if they're comparing themselves to the fake best. Right. And so I just cautioned them against that um, because it, it, they, if they get caught up in that, if they go down that rabbit hole, they can find themselves, you know, being disappointed over something that's not even real. Um, and, and, you know, the focus should be them, being better than themselves, you know, day after day, man. So um, the kids have it tough. They have it really, really tough. I'll tell you, if, if you guys haven't watched Lynch and, and Wendy's podcast, um, that's a situation. First of all, it's, it's, it's entertaining. It's really funny. <laughs> but you leave with a, a lesson, right? You definitely leave Every with time. a lesson. Or you leave with some insight that should make you actually think. I think I like consuming content that makes me think, right? And and I love the fact that we can now get, you know, bite-sized pieces of content. But I think it's, you just got to make sure your filter is working <laughs> and that your filter is on full blast, full tilt, because you can, you can, wind up just, you know, looking at something and, and spending hours and hours of time and not really learning anything, not really thinking. And um, so um, I think their their podcast is a great example of, yeah, it's going to make you chuckle and make you go for real. But man, it made me think and it made me look at my personal situation uh, to help me get better. So um yeah, but I, but I, I, you know, I question and I audit, like, what am I looking at? What am I watching? What am I paying attention to? Because if it's not serving me, helping me get better to help me get better for the people that count on me and for my com my community, then I'm, I'm clearly wasting time. And I just, I don't know about y'all. I just, that like, oh, that just bugs me to, to waste time. Right. So. Well, you feel I, like you have to get better. Been a question. Huh? Most people don't feel like they have to get better. Most people think they're good enough just because they showed up. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. That's true. Yeah, I think as leaders, um, it's our job to kind of help people um, draw the parallels to, you know, kind of what they're liking, what they're enjoying or what they're looking up to and just to pull the microcosms of life out of that and get them to understand the principles that are centered around, you know, how that person became successful or how this thing came about. And, you know, we're, we're teaching people some heavy stuff, but most of the times people want to escape you know, what they have going on in life and not realizing the very thing that they're escaping with or to um, actually may have the answers right there in it. And, you know, if we can kind of get them to get out of that sensational bag for a second and kind of get to, you know, back into the, you know, edutainment bag or, you know, that education bag. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of gold there and whatever it is that we're lending our time to, or, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Um, Cause we can be, you know, we can be at a presentation, but we need to be 
present. You know what I'm saying? We can be at, you know, a movie and still, you know, pull some, some, some super dope raw, um, you know, gems from there. You know what I mean? And it's just, so you just have to, you just got to be in a different space in your life to understand that, you know, this is just not for, you know, just to pass the time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Hey, hey, did y'all see um, Zuckerberg testing? I'm mean, testing, testifying in front of Congress. I saw a little bit Congress. of that. I saw a little bit. I don't know much about it, but I did see it. I did see it. Yeah. Made him apologize to the families. Yeah. Uh, basically saying that he was responsible for damaging kids' mental health via Facebook. Which I, would you have seen? not even on Facebook. Huh? The kid's not even on Facebook, man. <laughs> would you like? Would you have? Would you have done that? Would you have stood up and apologized to them for damaging? Like he that isn't that an admittance of guilt, right? Didn't he say he, pretty much by saying I apologize? He said, "I yeah, this this is what we did, and 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 we're guilty of damaging your kid's mental health." Yeah, I don't think his attorneys would let him apologize if that's what it meant, because they were sitting beside him. Okay, so they said they tapped him and was like, "Yo, go ahead and go ahead. It's it's okay to apologize." I don't. I think they would have told him not to talk, or they would have told him to stop if he was going to do something that was going to make it such that they were going to be, um, he'd be admitting guilt. Because I mean, then they're liable. That was the ultimate son move. He got sunned. Like, stand up. Don't you want to apologize? Stand up and apologize to the parents of the kids who your platform has affected mentally. He got sunned. Yeah, he's still rich. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, we, we, talked about, rich, man. You know, we talked about values. I talked about that today with the kids and I talked about, you know, them them, you know, we, we talked about their gifts, their goals and greatness. And um, the part of that conversation was, you know, your gifts will make room for you. Uh, mm. Your goals will help you hit the target. And your greatness is going to come from what you say and what you believe. It was not a conversation about money. As a matter of fact, I told them, don't chase money that you know if they if do the things we talked about they won't be able to stop the money and so yeah he's he's rich but can he sleep at night right probably <laughs> you know i but think he sleeps well values and where where does that value where where do those values kick in and how is it blended into the creation and the maintenance of of wealth um, Do you really think that he believes that they damaged or hurt kids by yeah. creating Facebook? Hundred yeah. percent. I think he believes that. It was. I think it's a plan. There's a book called Hooked. Pick that book up, and it talks about the formula to get people hooked on anything, really. But these platforms use that formula um, to get people hooked on on these social media platforms. And yeah, absolutely, I believe it. I believe he believes that. I know he knows that because it was, it was calculated. It was intentional to do uh, what they've done to get people hooked and really just feed them garbage. Really? They don't feed them. They don't feed them just water and and raw, raw vegetables. I would have expected you to say no. Huh? I would have expected you to say no. He doesn't believe that. I don't, he believes it. You th- you think the you think the drug dealer believes that he is doing what he's doing to the community? How he's not serving the community? What do you think? I, I focused on? think for a lot of drug dealers, it's a catch twenty two because many of them don't believe they're going to eat. Like most of them, start out from a survival and then it grows into greed. But um, I spent a lot of time in drug culture as a kid and it was their parents didn't make any money and they needed to make sure that they had a place to stay and food to eat. 
Got it. And then it grew from there because they wanted the nicer things because of the risks that they were taking. But do they actually think? And I mean, Jay-Z talked, we talked about Jay-Z earlier. He talks about the both sides of it. And I mean, Lynch, you can talk to this better probably than any of us. Um, but I, you, and you did talk about this a little bit of Vera Crip of it was the environment. Yeah. I mean, if this is just the way that the, the way that things are done and if you don't see anything outside of what you see around you is like, you're pretty likely to believe that that is true. And that's the way things are supposed to go. It doesn't make it an excuse, but it's likely that you believe that that is the way things are. Right. Get it. All right, man. Yo, y'all an hour in, man. That was dope. What you drinking? Hey. What, whoa, what's that? What's that? That don't look like water. That don't look like plain water. Yeah, but it's water, bro. Okay, my bad. It looked like yeah. a label. Like it had, like it was a beverage of sorts. <laughs> hey, I want to, I want to, um, I don't, I don't know if, Hey, I, I wish the I wish we were doing live podcasts, but anyway, um, I read where you know Super Bowl weekend is coming up, and I read where that is the most uh, uh, that is the time for the most human trafficking activity of any weekend in the world, wherever Why? the Super Bowl is. Um, because you have, you know, people, big spenders or whatever. And then in Vegas, you know, just uh, that's the it's a cultural thing. But it is it is like, you know, kind of like um, like that retail weekend in, in November, Black Friday and that weekend, how it pretty much makes or breaks, you know, retail for the year. I, I, I yeah. read something that talks about how sex trafficking is humongous mm. uh, Super Bowl weekend. And so I just want to make a plea to anybody and everybody that. Um, sees anything or feels like, you know, and then supposedly what you can look at, if you pay attention, you can look at someone that is caught up in that life. Mm. And, and, and sex trafficking is not like prostitution. It's not voluntary. It's you've been kidnapped. You've been brainwashed. You've been beaten and you've been threatened. So um, I just want to make a plea that we, um, as individuals, we just pay attention. And if we see something, you know, popping off, we tell somebody. That's it. Yeah. No, no nobody needs to be a sleuth or a, or an investigator, but just pay attention. That's all. So just want to put that out there. Appreciate that. Hey, man, look, how y'all feeling, man? We uh, we put it in this time and it, look. I'm ready to get the hell up out of here. I don't know about y'all, man. How y'all feel this week, though, man? Give me a rating of 1 to 10. How you feel this week? 10. 10. 10. He said yeah. 10. 11. 11. 11. He said, ooh, 11. 1, 10, man. I'm rocking them all cylinders right now. I'm fired up. I got a lot of work to do, so I got to keep my foot on the gas, man. Ready to rock and roll, man. All right, word. You going you to enjoy Ain't your no weekend letter. coming up, man, or are you going to be working? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to enjoy my weekend, man, because I'm going to get most of the work done before I even go. You know what I'm saying? And just go ahead and unplug for a second and then come back and plug right back in and keep it going. Know what I mean, you, you know how when you go on vacation, you do that. You like you like go, 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 go to get it done before you leave. What if we <laughs> operated like that all the time? Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying no, no more rabbit holes, but I'm just saying just a thought. Just to put that out there. I want to thank people for tuning in. I want to thank people for sharing these videos, I want to thank people for liking them. I want to thank people for commenting. I want to thank people for reaching out and, and talking trash about, you know, who we are, what we do. I want to thank anybody and everybody that has anything with promoting who we are and what we do. Um, I just want to say I appreciate you. Um, and yeah, t tonight was good, man. I got a bunch of energy right now, which means I need to go do something. I think I'll go do a bike ride, a Peloton ride or something. Hey. Um, when you finish, you come push, through. Uh, let's go. Yeah. Let's, why don't we go do that? put our feet up on a, a chair or something and, and go do three sets of thirty-three push-ups? Um, but yeah, man, I'm 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 hype. I'm excited about life, and uh, you know, with that, man, I'm Rod Brown, and I'm out.
I'm Lynn Chunt. And I'm Jerome Myers. And that's the Ooh. in-game podcast. We'll holler at in-game y'all podcast. Episode, man. Peace, power, love to the fab. <laughs> hey, what y'all think about the what y'all think about doing the remote joints versus being together? <laughs>